From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. Dedicated to man's imagination. The theater of the mind. As freshmen first we came to On college campuses across the nation from Bowdoin in Maine to Occidental in California this Indian summer afternoon, the freshman class is anxiously settling down to the first of its bright college years. For them, we have a story. It is a tender legend of the Yale of yesteryear, young man Axelrod, written by Sinclair Lewis, Yale class of 1907, and dramatized for the workshop and directed by William N. Robeson, class of 1928, narrated by John Hoysrott, class of 1926, and most particularly dedicated to the Yale class of 1961, young man Axel Broad. Here's good old Yale, drink it down, drink it down. Here's good old Yale, drink it down, drink it down. Here's good old Yale, she's so hearty and so hale. Drink it down, drink it down, drink it down, down, down. And it was a September afternoon in one of the years between the two world wars. The great elms of the old campus wore the last of summer's greenery. The warm sun caressed the gothic crag of Harkness and spread a golden sheen on the weathered bricks of Connecticut Hall, before which Nathan Hale, class of 1773, forever stands in bronze, despairing that he has but one life to give for his country. Into this timeless scene, through the entry between Osborne and Vanderbilt Halls, strode an anachronistic figure, a rugged, white-bearded old man, wearing a neatly pressed black broadcloth suit and celluloid collar, Knut Axelbrod, retired Minnesota farmer, a man with a destination, the office of the dean of Yale College. Come in. Excuse me, uh, you are the dean of the college? Yes. I am uh, Knut uh, Axelbrod. Yes, Mr. Axelbrod. What can I do for you? I am here about uh, entering college. I see. And where is the young man? The young man? Yes. Your son, or perhaps your grandson? Oh, uh, no, sir. It, it's me. Uh, it is I. You? <clears throat> well, I must say this is rather irregular. No, sir. Everything is regular. I pass all the examinations. It wasn't easy, but I pass. <clears throat> yes. Yes, yes, so I see. Yes, is your name Knut Axelbrod? Yeah, that's me. Yes, yes, yes. Everything seems to be in order. But, Mr. Axelbrod... Yeah? If you please pardon me for saying this, but you are not, well, not exactly the usual age of our beginning students. Oh, yeah, I, I know, but... Um, what? Well, there's a fellow said once... Uh, Youth is so wonderful, it is a shame it must be wasted on the very young. But... And uh, I feel still young. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure you do. But I'm still curious. About what, Dean? Why Yale? Why did you want to come to Yale? Well, uh, uh, how could I say that? Uh, yeah. All my life I work hard. I farm my land, I raise my family, I get up with the sun, I go to bed with the sun, and always I say... That is not enough. Always I say, Knut, you are a dummy. I say, what good is a man without education? And then when my last son is grown man, I quit. I give him the farm and I say, Knut, now you can get education. So I read. All day long I read. Sometimes half the night. I, I read almost all the books in the public library back home in your Ireland. Then one day I uh, read the book about Yale. And I say, by golly, I got to go there and, and learn some more. Um, what book did you read? Stover at Yale. Hmm. Yes. But, Mr. Axelbrod, you understand that Yale has changed a lot since that book was written. Oh, Yale is Yale. I believe that. Oh, so do I, sir. But Yale is for, well, 
What I mean to say is that, um... What you mean to say uh, is uh, maybe uh, Yale is for the learning of beauty? Eh, yes. Yes, I suppose that is what I meant to say. <laughs> And so, Knut Axelbrod was duly registered as a freshman in Yale College and assigned a room, not in Berkeley Oval where the cream boys of the prep school cliques lolled in comparative luxury, but in a grubby frame building far down High Street where were lodged the unplaced freshmen, the scrub seniors and assorted grinds and self-help students. Here he met his roommate, Ray Gribble. Come in, doors open. Are you Mr. Gribble? Yeah. I am Mr. Axelbrod. Oh, whatever you're selling, I don't want any. Oh, well, I'm not uh, selling anything. I am your new roommate. Y- your what? Your roommate. Who said so? The fellow at the registrar's office, he said to come here, room 18, and he say my roommate would be Mr. Gribble. <sighs> well, beggars can't be choosers. Uh, please? Uh, nothing. Hey, you can have that bed over in the corner. Got a couple of broken springs, I'm afraid. You know how it is. First come, first served. Oh, sure, sure. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Wait, wait, freshman, wait. Wait for the sun strikes the sky. Knut Axelbrod set out to savor the college he had learned from a book. He sat on the Yale fence in what he felt was an appropriate pose, not knowing that this was no longer done, not realizing why the undergraduates snickered as they passed. He went out to Yale Field to watch the football tryouts, but when he tried to get acquainted with the beefy candidates, they clearly indicated they thought he was crazy. Everywhere his warm overtures of friendship were met with the cruel, cold disinterest of youth. He was not a campus character. He was the class freak. T'was Brillig and the slithy tolls did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the boar grove. Hey, Axelbrod, pipe down. I got a math assignment to finish. Oh, I'm sorry, Gribble. <laughs> you know what this, this book? <laughs> By golly, it's so funny. What book? Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland? Is that your English assignment? Oh, no. Well, then why are you wasting your time on it? It's funny, by golly. (laughs) I don't understand you, Axel Broad. I just don't understand you. Why? I'm a simple fellow. Well, it strikes me a man of your years ought to be thinking about saving his soul instead of reading children's books. Oh, I don't think Alice in Wonderland is very much for children. It says some pretty deep things in a funny way. Rubbish. And my soul's in pretty good hands. I go to chapel every morning. It's compulsory. Axelbrod, what is your purpose in life? What do you hope to get out of Yale? I can't say it very well, but um, there was a fellow once uh, maybe said it better. He said, truth is beauty and beauty truth. That's all you know on earth and all you need to know. You try to buy a meal with truth and try paying the rent with beauty... Uh, the same fellow said, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It will never pass into nothingness. Yes, but remember Longfellow's exhortation. Uh, let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate. Still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor. Yeah, but another fellow said, the world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our power. Oh, you are a hopeless romantic, Axel Broad, and I doubt if you will ever amount to a hill of beans. Hi, Gribble. Hi, Axel. Well, well, how's old man Axel Broad tonight? Good evening, Atchison. I think our bearded wonders in his second childhood. I just caught him reading Alice in Wonderland. You'd do better to work on that English assignment for tomorrow, that merchant of Venice. I can't make head and a tail out of Shakespeare. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth like a gentle rain from heaven. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives. You know it by heart. I learned it a long time ago. Yeah, but do you know what it means? Yeah, I think so. That beats me. Listen. What is that? The whiffin' poofs over at Maury's. Whiffin' poofs? What is whiffin' poofs? A whiff and poof is an undergraduate with a rich father and a so-called singing voice. He's got nothing to worry about. 
He can afford to hang around Maury's and drink beer and sing every night. His old man pays the bills. He doesn't have to work for his education the way fellows like Atchison and I do. But if it weren't for us, they'd never get through college. We wait tables for them, we tutor them. I we... think it's not so bad to enjoy life when you're young. That is such a long, long time afterwards when there is nothing but work. I say the time to learn proper work habits is when you're young. Yeah, that's right, Gribble. These rich kids couldn't get their first base without their old man's money behind them. Take Washburn, for instance. No, no, don't talk to me about Washburn. Oh, what's the matter with Washburn? Is he a bit and poop? Not even that. He doesn't do anything. He's a disgrace to the class. I mean, he doesn't go out for anything. Yeah, he claims he's a poet, but he doesn't even heal the lit. He's a bloody snob. But he seems like a nice young fella. How would you know? You ever talk to him? No, but I've seen him in class. When? He cuts most of them. Well, that's one consolation. He'll probably flunk out at midterm. No, not him. He gets on the dean's list, his old man will throw the university another million-dollar endowment. That's the way these bright boys get through. You know what you fellas sound like? What? A bunch of hired hands talking behind the barn at harvest time. What's that mean? They don't own the farm, they don't like the farmer, and they can be replaced any time. Look here, Axel Broad, I don't think I like that remark. Oh, be quiet, little boy. And listen to the written poofs. Earth is earth wherever one walks upon it, be it Camelot or Minnesota or on the Yale campus, possibly even in the Harvard Yard. The buildings ceased to be temples to Knut Axelbrod. They became structures of brick and stone. Many of them beautiful, some of them excessively ugly. The young men ceased to be young gods, but individuals, many of them pleasant hedonists, some of them excessively rude. Even the professors ceased to resemble latter-day Socrates. And so, gentlemen, there was no doubt in the mind of Themistocles. He and only he was certain of the meaning of the oracle's words... Your safety lies in wooden walls. Well, then what she said. <laughs> what could she say, shit. considering the uh, circumstances? Was the background for one of the, the professor is talking. I'll well, pipe down, down, Whiskers. Maybe I pipe you down sometimes. Any time, Pop, any time. That is all. Good day, gentlemen. <laughs> say, Professor. Yes, Axel Broad. Uh, I'd like to speak to you one minute. Yes, what is it? You're a fine fellow, Professor. I'd like to hear what you say. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm pretty strong, fellow, and I do something for you. What are you driving at? But these fellas in the class, they don't pay attention. You just call on me. I spank the son of a guns for you. Uh, uh, thanks so much, Axel Broad, but I don't fancy that will be necessary. After all, they're not schoolboys. They're young gentlemen. Well, then why don't they act like it? Uh, speaking of behavior, Axel Broad, there's something I've been wanting to mention to you. Oh, yes, Professor. I do wish you wouldn't show off so much when I call upon you during quizzes. Show off? Yes. You answer at such needless length, and you smile as though you find something highly amusing about me. Oh, no, Professor. No, I don't know I smile. If I do, I, I guess it's just because I am so glad when my stupid old head gets the lesson good. Uh, yes, well, that must be very gratifying, I'm sure. But in the future, let's be more careful, shall we? Hmm? Yes, sir. Good day, Axel Broad. Down from the Harkness Tower floated the chimes of noon, unheeded by the busy undergraduates piling out of classes, crisscrossing the campus as they dashed for eating clubs and fraternity houses but not unheeded by the old man with bowed head and no place to go and no one to go with. Going home, the chimes sang to Knut Axelbrod. Going home. And before his misty eyes, the flaring red and orange of the autumn trees and the yellowing ivy-covered walls seemed to give way to the rolling gray stubble of his Minnesota farm. He had to get away from the campus, from the students. He had to get away by himself somewhere, anywhere where he would not be reminded how alone he was. He walked slowly out Whitney Avenue toward the butte-like hill of East Rock. 
And there, sitting atop the rock, at last he found a friend. That's quite a view, isn't it, Axelbert? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry I startled you. Oh, <laughs> no, that's all right. I... You're Washburn, uh, aren't you? That's right. I don't think we ever met officially, but I know who you were, of course. Yeah, I guess everybody knows who I am. Mind if I share the bench with you? No, no, go ahead. Yeah. You cutting classes, too? Yeah. Today, I cut classes. You know, Axelbrod, I'm glad to have run into you. You are? Why? Well, I've been thinking quite a lot about you lately, and it seems to me we have a lot in common. You and me? Mm Mm-hmm. We're the class scandals, you know. We came here to dream. These busy little goats like Atchison and Giblets, or whatever your roommate's name is, think we're fools not to buck for grades. I guess you're right. Uh, they, They are so serious about everything. Grades, the football team, burning their way. They never laugh. So sometimes I think they are older than me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, that is a pretty book you have there. Oh, this is the poems of Alfred de Musset. You like to look at it? Yeah. I never see such a book. Leather is so soft. Printing is in gold. Uh, it's a foreign book. I can't read that. But, you know, that is the kind of book I always wanted to hold in my hands. Would you like to hear a little of it? Yeah, yeah, please. Je livre toute ma jeunesse. Je l'ai fait sans presque y songer. Il y paraît, je le confesse. Et j'aurais pu le corriger. By golly, that is pretty. Well, it means... No, I don't care what it means. It, it is like music. Like music I never heard before. Music? Well, say, that reminds me. Schoenstein is playing Lalo tonight. Oh, I thought the game was tomorrow. Oh, no, 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 no. Schoenstein is a violinist. Lalo is a composer. I've got a couple of tickets now. Maybe you'd like to go with me. Oh, sure. I'd like to hear a fellow play fiddle. You know, we got the fellow back home, Uli Hansen. He can play turkey in the straw faster than anyone in Cottonwood County. <laughs> oh, Schoenstein isn't exactly that kind of fiddler, but I think you might enjoy him. Sure I will, by golly. <laughs> This was fiddling such as Knut had never dreamed of. This was more than music to the old man. It was beauty beyond bearing. The rapier flashes of the violin tore jagged wounds in his soul. And in the next phrase, soothed them, bound them, and healed them with the heavenly unguent of melody. Knut did not listen. He felt the music, submerged himself in it, and sank slowly into its all enveloping arms. Long after the last note died away, the music played on in Knut's memory as he sat in the room of his new friend having a midnight snack. There we are. Tea is brewed nicely. Sugar? Lemma? Afraid I have no cream. Uh, just tea, please. Right. Uh, do try some of this pâté de foie gras. Uh, what's that? You try it. You'll like it. Thank you. What do you call it? Uh, pâté de foie gras. That tastes like the liver sausage we got back home. <laughs> well, yes, I suppose it does. Well, that's what it is, really. It's goose liver. Oh, well, then why don't they call it goose liver? Well, you see, that's the French name. Aha. Uh-huh. You, you've been to France? Oh, yes. A uh, matter of fact, I spent all last year in Paris. You did? Yes. But what is it like? Paris? Well... Its women are the most beautiful in the world. Its men the wisest. Its food the finest. Its boulevards the grandest. And its monuments the most, well, monumental. Paris is beauty. Well, maybe it's a good thing I never go there. Why? Well, that's the way I thought about Yale before I come here. Well, yes, I I guess beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, Maybe you see different things when you are an old man. Oh, come on now. Now, you're not an old man. Uh, that's what they call me. Old man Axelbrod. Oh, nonsense to me. You're a young man, Axelbrod. 
I am. Why, certainly. People like you and I don't go old. The talk went on and on. Good talk of books and philosophy and beauty. The talk Knut Axelrod had thirsted for all his life. But at last the fire had burned to ashes, the candles were guttering, and the window was a gray rectangle of twilight dawn. Look! By golly, it's daylight! Oh, oh, so it is. Well, I go to bed now, I think. Well, I suppose that's about all that's left to do. I, uh... I don't have the right words, maybe, but I, I want to say thanks. Thanks for what? For this night. I think this night is what I, I came to college for, this one night. Well, I... Uh, we must do it again sometime, real soon. Yeah, we do that. Well, I, uh... Well, look here, uh, uh, Newt, take this, will you? Oh, the pretty little poetry book? Yes. But, uh... No, I want you to have it. Please. Uh, thank you, Gil. Thank you. But life cannot be only good talk before a crackling fire. Dawn comes cold, dawn comes gray, dawn brings reality. As Knut Axelbrod walked across the morning empty campus, he knew what he must do. Age and youth. They just don't mix. This beautiful place belongs to the young men, not to me. And that boy, well, if I saw him again, it would not be the same. I tell him all I got to say tonight. Next time I wouldn't be young man, Axel Broad. I'd just be an old boar. I live 65 years for tonight. It was worth it. That afternoon in the day coach of a westbound train, an old man sat smiling, a look of great content in his eyes, and in his hands a small book in French, though the curious fact is that this old man couldn't read one single word of French. <laughs> You have listened to the CBS Radio Workshop production of Young Man Axelbrod by Sinclair Lewis, adapted for radio and directed and produced by William N. Robeson. John Hoyt was the narrator. Carl Swenson played Young Man Axelbrod, and others in the cast included John Daner, Dick Crenna, Jackie Kelk, Ben Wright, and Frank McDonald. The chorus was under the direction of Amerigo Marino. With this program, we conclude the current series of workshop productions. We wish to thank the many, many loyal listeners whose constructive and intelligent letters have encouraged, inspired, and directed our efforts in presenting plays in the theater of your mind. We look forward to resuming this rewarding task in the not-too-distant future. Until then, thanks and goodbye. This is the CBS Radio Network.